Thanks for having me today, and I guess special thanks to Holly for uh, coaxing me into speaking. Uh, this is a bit of material that I often deliver to either actual operations groups or uh, at some university courses that I sort of guest speak at. So it's a pretty broad, uh, open-ended uh, discussion, but I hope it gives you a bunch of useful tools that you can take to your workplaces and actually apply and get some real value. Um, so today I'm talking about operational excellence uh, un under the framework of good strategy. Um, what is good strategy? I want to talk a little bit about that because people can get pretty cynical about the word strategy. Uh, and then I'm going to walk through the diagnosis uh, of good strategy, how to guide you through that and execute good strategy and, and I guess where I'm coming from the real gritty end of strategy is the actual doing bit um, that's the often, often the part that doesn't get done well. And then uh, we'll have a little bit of time at the end for some Q&A. So why do we need to be strategic about operational excellence? Um, and coming back to my point of being cynical, I'm here to talk to you about strategy and I would almost guarantee that someone in this room is thinking, uh, what's this guy on about? And does he actually mean doing things or does he mean just pontificating about doing some stuff? Uh, and the thing I like to bring up is the four Russians model of strategy. That's not really what I'm here today to talk about. It's your typical consultant's version of strategy where we do some more of some stuff, less of some stuff, we get rid of some stuff and we toss in a few extra things. Um, so in reality, what I want to get across to everyone today is if you want to talk about operational excellence and being strategic about it, it actually gets right down to are the behaviors of personnel at a shop floor level changing sustainably? And that's really hard to do. So what, what I would ask is please set aside your cynicism. It's probably correct because a lot of people get strategy wrong and they don't actually adopt uh, strategies that uh, empower the shop floor. Um, so please give me half a chance and I hope I can walk you through some tools where you see strategy as not just um, a loose framework but an actual gritty thing that you can deploy into your operations. Um, I think I've said this but what I want to say uh, on top of that is please commit to me if you can, listen but also take away at least one key learning and uh, I'm on LinkedIn if anybody finds anything particularly useful. I'd like to understand and get feedback from you what uh, might be actually bridging that gap, as Holly said, between the real world and the theoretical world and actually adding some value for you. Um, so why does operational excellence really matter and why do we care? And I think there's a heap of reasons why we should care and we should take it seriously and we should hold ourselves accountable to getting operational excellence right. Um, but I'm going to present one uh, particular framework that s stands out to me as, as an absolute imperative that we get it right. Um, and that's this graph and I want to introduce you guys to a guy named Ron Moore and if you haven't read his work, uh, he wrote a book called Operational Excellence, uh, Making Uncommon Sense Common Sense. He is just has a wonderful trove of data of plants and this actually happens to be a WA based operation. Um, where this graph holds true and that basically says that if you have a predictable performance of a, out of an asset, um, and I'm probably typically talking about process plants, but I would be happy to say that this data would, sh would show in, in any operational context. Um, if you have a predictable and reliable plant operation, you're going to have good safety outcomes. And I, th I would really challenge everybody to think about that and, and think of an instance where it doesn't matter because with me it really resonates and I love this because the data in this graph and everywhere I've worked really stacks up to say if you do more reactive work you're going to hurt more people. Um, and I, when I say reactive work I don't just mean maintenance work, I mean unplanned in the broadest sense of the word. Are you in control and managing your affairs well? That's going to dictate whether you do safety well. And nice uh, corollary that happens with exactly all these plants as well is if you have a reliable plant you're going to get the safety right but you're also going to get the cost right and a bunch of other flow on benefits. So I think there's a pretty strong case that people uh, probably undercook how strategic they should be about operational excellence and that they should because if, if you believe in safety you should believe in operational excellence. 
Um, and this graph uh, sort of particularly applies to ramp ups, but I like to put it up because uh, I think it still carries on to sustainable production. But it's great because it's ben benchmarked against a few plants that I've been involved in recently. And then obviously McNulty curves that are sort of a more broad uh, many, many plants to sort of check ourselves against. But what I want to highlight is some of the good uh, operations I've been involved in where they ramp up well and sustainably produce. You, get, you do get that effect where you're not hurting people and you're below operating cost. So this is just two example plants. We literally had no recordable injuries from a startup being day one of commissioning through to sort of 24 months into production. And we didn't have injuries after that. I just stopped showing the data there. And I personally moved on from those operations to take other challenges on. So again, just another snapshot of why it's imperative that we really do take operational excellence seriously. Um, so here's the strategy framework coming up. Spoiler alert, please, cynics, open your minds for one minute. Um, I, I just want to start with a quote that says, are we operating like cattle, just doing what we do because that's what we're doing? Or are we actually stepping back because we're bright, intelligent human beings and actually thinking about the broader patterns of what we're doing and how we can do things differently? Um, so just challenge you to think like a human when you're going through this presentation, and hopefully I can provide some ideas and stimulation that make you think about uh, what you can do differently. So this is a framework uh, where the cynics will look at me and think airy-fairy, but I love this book. I apply this framework in everything I do, literally. Uh, and Richard Rommel wrote a book called Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, and what he says is that there's this disconnect in the, in the world between the thinking about strategy and the doing of it. And so he's come up with this concept. This is my uh, interpretation of his book, which is the kernel of, of strategy. And what he says is it's not enough to just diagnose what your problems are. And it's not enough to just say some guidance on how you're going to do it. Uh, the real grit behind his book, he calls it gritty strategy, is like getting right down to the absolute fine details, work breakdown structure of how are you going to execute and eat the elephant. And so I like to uh, use this framework to determine almost everything I do on a, on a professional and sometimes to the detriment of my wife's personal basis, um, what, what we're going to do to do strategy right and actually get the results. And so what I'm going to talk through today are those three categories, some examples from, from my professional life where I found some useful tools how to diagnose things, how to guide your, your way through it and get the results you want, and then literally coherent actions, some really specific sort of granular level stuff that I've sort of just cherry picked and thrown in to help uh, provide some learnings, I hope. Um, so into the tools and starting with um, diagnosis. Um, this is, I guess, process plan specific in terms of I interpreted this from a Ron Moore book and made it my sort of version of, of what he tries to get across. And this is a tool that I health check all my teams with against regularly. And there's a bunch of things that sit behind this uh, five-spoked wheel. But what I'd encourage you is to think about each and just look at, at on a diagnosis level, take the helicopter view as a starting point and think about where might my problems be in my existing operation. Do we have the right leadership, processes and practices? Did we create an environment of teamwork? Do we have the right performance measures? And more importantly, do we have a common purpose on strategy and performance? Um, and then sort of getting down into some granular diagnosis tools. Uh, everybody's seen spider web charts before, but this is a really telling picture because it takes uh, the complexity of oper operational excellence requiring like many things that need to be done well to sum up to a good outcome and sort of just capturing it on a chart. And I like to, I do these surveys all the time in various operations and I like to put the low and the high scores into the, them. And then I also like to compare a maintenance team scores, a production team scores, a warehouse team scores. And it's very interesting because you'll see that um, not just that there's a finite answer to are we doing um, product, uh, proactive maintenance well, but that each team actually has a different view of whether or not you're doing it well. And, and you don't get concrete answers, but you get a really good pulse check on where your problem areas might be or where you just may have a communication issue. 
Um, two more spider diagrams here, but what I want to say is the previous two were about sort of mechanistic how to do production, and these are about management, teamwork, and leadership. And I guess my I'll talk about some some more tools further on. Like it's it's upon us to measure the strength of our leadership, and I would uh, argue that you can do it. A lot of people tell me you can't do it very well, but I think there's some really good tools out there that tell you whether you're doing well with leadership or not, and I would also argue that that will entirely determine if you're going to be successful with operational excellence. Interesting, these two graphs are exactly the same done by two different teams being in maintenance and production, and you can see a pretty big difference. Um, and this is uh, one really useful framework I hope you could put to work and you literally just have to open your Oz IMM mind managers textbook to see something like this. And what I'm trying to get across here is you put your operation in a Deming framework of plan, do, check, act, and then you literally just traffic light it. And it's not a one-off, it's literally sitting down and looking at yourself in the mirror and getting everyone to give honest and sometimes blunt feedback whether the uh, processes you have on paper are actually happening in reality and more often than not when I find myself especially in the last two years in roles where I have to go into operations and try and find ways to affect change there's some fantastic processes existing there but they're just collecting dust on a shelf they're not being used properly or they've lost their way as as an operation evolves and so it's always good to do a really honest blunt health check with this overall framework to say what are we doing daily, shiftly, weekly, monthly, quarterly that's going to keep driving us towards the outcomes and are we doing it with discipline. There's varying degrees that you can color code this but I always like to go green is only ever on there if you really think it's an efficacious process. Um, and then uh, I guess I often have a role where I'm a third party person who's giving uh, opinions on your operation, right? But I also uh, run our own operations and I, and I literally do this. I bring in external people to give me a more uh, blunt opinion of what we're doing as well. So I just want to um, throw an example up there to say there are people out there who can compare you against multiple similar operations. In this case, it's a fixed plant uh, survey. But if you're doing anything in operations, find the people who are exposed to multiple operations and, and honestly benchmark yourself against others. It's the best way to diagnose. And the only other thing I just caveat that with is I encourage everyone to benchmark yourself, not just within mining, but think about other industries because my experience is they do things better than us. We do some things better than others, but there's a lot of learnings outside. So yes, benchmark yourselves against very similar uh, facilities, but also then look at some things outside of what you do to figure out what you can learn. Um, last diagnosis one, uh, bow ties are a risk-based tool and a lot of people will get turned off by that, but I really uh, would encourage you to look at them and think of them just as a facilitation tool. And I really honestly believe this because I've done hundreds of them now. If you just put some butch paper on a table and you really understand the process of how a bow tie works, it really aligns teams of sort of eight to 12 people. What are the core causes of things that might get you dis derailed off the tracks? And what are we going to do about it? So thinking of it less just purely as a risk management tool, uh, think of it as a facilitation tool. And um, I'm happy to take inquiries on LinkedIn if you want to talk about it. But it, it really honestly is a fantastic tool just to get teams of people rowing in the same direction. Um, this is an example out of a, a spodumene plant that we recently uh, got out of a state of unable to make grade and recovery to a point of sustainable, predictable production. And my observation there around operational excellence is, especially in ramp up periods, people are so uh, pressured by the decisions that need to be made hourly and daily. It's very hard to actually lift yourself out of the weeds and make conscious uh, strong decision making. And so what we did here literally is we grabbed all the subject matter experts we could find in and around us and in other companies and we took everybody off site including the plant mats and everybody just to take the pressure off for at least three or four hours to say how are we going to do this and if you look at flotation we mapped it out. There was 48 levers that we could pull 
And it wasn't clear to us prior to the workshop which levers were the best ones to be working with. And in all honesty, what was happening is multiple levers were being pulled all the time and we weren't getting anywhere. And then the second piece of that, so map out the levers, but then make some kind of ruthless framework, literally, where as, as you're diagnosing, you're going to find these complex, intractable problems have so many uh, rabbit holes and things you can go down. Just stick to this, keep it on the wall. It's something simple that says, yes, we'll, we'll drill down on this one. No, move on. No, move on. Um, you'll have to do that. So here's an example. Um, and so coming back to diagnosing leadership and culture, uh, this is something I do with my teams, and I just find it incredibly powerful. And I just, uh, there's probably multiple others out there, and I just want to share this one because I find it quite simple and elegant to actually sort of answer some of those questions around what I think is the most important part of operational excellence, which is good leadership. Um, so we literally, uh, when I have a new hire, anyone in my team, uh, they can probably attest to this in a, in a negative way maybe, they sit with me and they go through these 12 questions and we talk about what they mean and how we might actually aspire to be better at them. And so what are they? They're actually surprisingly simple and they correlate with companies that have low employee turnover, they have high per, uh, profit, they're long-term businesses, and they're basically what I call a great workplace. So when I talk to people about these questions, it's about what do we need to do to foster a great workplace? And I think operational excellence just flows on from that without even trying. And it, you know, so I'll just pick a couple here. Do I know what's expected of me at work? Um, it sounds like a simple thing, but I honestly ask a lot of people and they don't know. They don't know where they stand. They don't know what's required of them. Um, it's pretty disappointing, but it's a real thing. Does my supervisor care about me as a person? I mean, these are things that I can't put a number on, right? But I can, I can measure in an annual survey and I literally give my superintendents KPIs that say year on year, you need to show me that you're improving on this. Um, so I encourage you guys to look it up. It comes out of uh, basically what's called a Gallup poll, thousands of companies, and they just worked out what makes companies better than others. It's not perfect, I'm not saying it is, but I'd encourage you all to think about is there a tool out there that you can use that's, you know, you won't, you won't want more than s sort of 12 questions, but this is a really fantastic thing to talk to your teams about. And this is literally me just sketching on my iPad. They're not hard and fast numbers because I'm not telling you this will solve the world's problems. But I've run, this is a little bit dated now, I've run this at four plants. And, and I can tell you it really does correlate with good safety performance, good cost performance. They all go together with great workplace. Um, so think about it. Uh, think about if there's other good polls out there that you can use or other ways to measure leadership. But don't, uh, what I don't think is excusable is not measuring leadership at all. And then I would just argue this is an extension of doing something like a 12Q survey, but um, again, really good tool. And again, I'm happy to talk at more detail with anyone who's interested. Uh, this is pretty standard in our industry to see Bradley curves uh, thrown around, but a really wonderful uh, facilitation tool to get your teams talking about where are we actually at on the, on the safety paradigm uh, maturity is this Bradley tool and getting people to actually draw it on a whiteboard and explain it is a really powerful way to say, if we're here, we're gonna apply these sort of things to move people along the maturity curve. And if we're actually here, or sometimes our teams are disagreeing. Some people think we're here and some people think we're in natural instincts mode. Um, however it pans out, right? Massive value added. If you can actually step your teams out of the production pressures for a period of time long enough for them to actually think about where are we actually at, and then get other views to challenge them. Um, so that's the first bit. A few tools, I hope, that can help you diagnose what, where are we at in terms of operational excellence. That's that high-level helicopter view stuff that the cynics are going, oh, where is he going with this? Um, the next step that Rummelt says is really fantastic for strategy is guiding policy. So are we going to kill and maim people along the way? No, we're not. It's the things that we need to do to keep us within the boundaries of where we think uh, is good practice. And I'm just going to talk through some examples again of what I think uh, will make sure that your strategy prevails in a, in a positive way. Uh, so not going to dwell on this again, but I really think people should put this in your guiding policy 
And Ron Moore goes to the point where he says companies, all ha we all have our safety policy that says basically we're not going to hurt people. And I, I actually believe this and our industry uh, probably isn't there yet, but one day should be that what, are, what you should have is a reliability policy that says we will be reliable, therefore we will be safe. Because this data is so ubiquitous to me that when we do reactive work, we hurt people that you know, stopping short of not actually taking it seriously is, is a fault. So guiding policy, I'm suggesting strongly, could include something around reliability. And I, I rarely, rarely see com companies that do that, if ever. Um, and this is perhaps uh, because in the last couple of years, I've been parachuted into several operations to help uh, get production um, moving in the right direction, but I'm just absolutely flabbergasted how often I run into plants where things are hopelessly unstable and lo and behold we're actually drawing uh, fairly detailed accurate conclusions about the root causes of problems in the plant and what's going on and we're making changes in the plant. I, I really uh, this isn't so much a tool as me being on a soapbox for one minute to say your guiding policy should talk about uh, plant stability and in all honesty you need to be measuring that very clearly per unit process because uh, every plant I go to basically we're making decisions um, that really when you go back to the data have no basis because the noise in the data is so much greater than what you're trying to prove as an outcome that it, it becomes a fruitless exercise. So you just you, you basically can't learn without stability so any successful strategy should therefore have stability as a core component of execution. Um, and so you've, you've seen the five-spoked wheel that I like to pulse check against at a high level helicopter and, and again, cynics in the room, I invite you to critique me afterwards. I think you should have a statement and it's not about a value statement just plastered up on the wall. I, I mean it's something that you talk about seriously and I literally, I run a, a leadership program at Primero and I talk about this every, every week and, and I say we put reliability and stability first we will use what I, the words I use, precision operating practices. When I, when I go into a control room, I want to see like a cockpit of an aircraft. It's probably not realistic of me, but one day maybe we'll get there, right? We will use precision, startup, shutdown, and steady state practices. Um, so I just would say aspire to excellence and one day we'll get there. I, I really believe we can. I'm, and I've had the really great fortune of being involved in some operations that have just completely turned around, especially in the last couple of years. And, uh, and I think it's, it's about really setting a high bar, even if you think it's unable to be achieved, and just aiming for it. Um, guiding policy, we need to talk to our people about prioritization. So I often run these workshops at operations, and I spend a lot of time on this. This is just one slide. And I talk about like the overwhelming deluge of activity hitting us. And it honestly resonates with me that it always comes back to 20% of your problems are probably giving you 80% of your heartache. So focus on the 20%. Um, so I put it another way, 20% of the problems, 80% of your production losses. And we all have Pareto graphs going all the time. All I'm saying is don't just look at downtime, look at leadership problems, look at everything in the lens of Pareto, which says, for 20% of the effort, you can somehow get 80% of the benefit and be ruthless because what I often see is just paralysis by action in operations where there's not enough people to do jobs. Uh, so a guiding policy should say, we want you guys to be ruthless and just use Pareto, just knock everything else out, just focus on the top 20. Uh, so this framework I use all the time. I probably haven't had enough traction with uh, people I talk to about it. I'd love some feedback on it, but this is my interpretation of a book called uh, Principles by Ray Dalio. And what he says, and I just seem to see this again and again in operations, is that there's the two traditional ways to make decisions, and one is the complete autocracy dictator style where one person makes all the decisions and they know best. And then that can actually be very effective and efficient, right? And we, we see it continue to um, be deployed in our, in our businesses all over the world. There's the other end of the spectrum where people say, we have a democracy, we, everyone's opinion counts, and you're gonna 
get a hint of hypocrisy here because in the 12 questions, one of the most important ones to me is everyone's opinion counts. Um, the most popular idea seems to win in, in these scenarios. And what Ray Dalio says is there's a really important point in the middle there where you are far more likely to get a better decision outcome, which is that you have what he calls believability weighted decisions. So uh, they take it to the point where they, they rate people on iPads and stuff literally. It's, you don't need to do that. You just need to be conscious about who are the most believable people uh, available to you, not even just within your business, get them to actually disagree with each other and you will find uh, you're making better decisions. So I encourage people to actually try and put a framework. It doesn't have to be this one. Is like, how, are we making decisions like autocrats? Uh, are we pretending to be democratic? And probably neither of those are the optimum. There's some way to make better decisions in the middle. Um, and then this one, I think people have seen it, but I rarely see it. And when I do, it's not done well. But you actually can do this. Uh, it's absolutely fantastically powerful. Um, incentives do matter. Um, you know, my, one of my favorite authors, Charlie Munger, says that his whole life uh, he's, he's thought that he's one of the most advanced people in that he knows, understanding just how powerful incentives are. And he says even still he constantly underestimates how powerful they are. So think about incentives. We, we often just kind of shoehorn KPI programs and things into our operations because we're busy, they're undercooked, they're actually commanding all the wrong things. Figure out ways to make people actually be aligned on incentives. And um, I honestly I almost never come across any team of people who've done this well. Uh, and there's probably two standouts for me in my career. And it was absolutely powerful. So have a think about it. Uh, this is one I've kind of written ab about in Oz IMM before. Uh, I think we're in an era, I strongly believe we're in an era now where professionals uh, like those of us in the room right now, we need to be more than just the uh, single silo that we probably deem ourselves to be early in our careers. And so this, what I call fat T, I'm sure there's a more academic version of it somewhere, fat T-shaped professionals. What we need to be is deep in at least two disciplines. And the, you know, like the one that comes to mind for me, I've met some really stunning people who speak the geological and metallurgical languages almost uh, fluently, right? And that's, the sum of that person is worth like 10 people to me in, in the operations I've been involved with. Um, and often it's a strange combination that will give outsized value, like you're an accountant with a metallurgy degree. Uh, you name it, right? But when you combine two things that don't typically go together, you can be absolutely uh, stupendously valuable. Uh, so I'd encourage uh, all of us individually, but also in your teams, think about how do you actually bridge that sort of wide and, and deep knowledge to, to foster value. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, high level stuff, but again, I do take this really seriously to the point I'm drinking water, not beer tonight. Um, I speak about this weekly with uh, the leadership program at Primero. Um, this is an example again out of Ray Dalio's book, Principles, and I just use it because I think it's one of the best I've read. Uh, we value that our people are, they think independently, they argue open-mindedly, they value the intense pursuit of truth and excellence. They're not just an employee, but someone we'd like to share our lives with. Um, they're considerate, have a high sense of personal accountability, um, and they have generous natures and high standards of fairness. Um, and I think uh, last but not least, and it's something I talk to my teams about constantly, is ego. Uh, they're able to set aside their egos and assess themselves candidly. And uh, we're all guilty, myself included, that we let our egos uh, get the best of us and allow us to not make good decisions, but it's about most of the time stepping outside of that ego and being able to assess. Um, this one's sort of very plant specific, but it, it kind of comes down to my uh, growing understanding that a lot of the problems in operations that I come across, people are actually making too many decisions. It sounds funny, but um, there's so much data and stimulus coming at us these days that we tend to react, 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 react. And I'm not saying this is always the case, but I think it's important we put a framework and a guiding policy around it to say, actually, 
a lot of the time you're better off not to react. Um, so not universal, but think about uh, things in your operations where poor decisions might be made. And I'm just suggesting there may be a root cause there where you're actually reacting to something that you don't even know the causes behind. Um, and this is coming back to my other favorite person, Ron Moore. Uh, this is from a huge data set, and so I, f I find it really interesting that uh, a lot of operations I go to, and I think this will resonate with a lot of people in the room, the default is to blame maintenance for uh, production losses and various other things. And what the findings actually say is that what's in maintenance control is about 10% of overall losses. And uh, you may not choose to believe me here tonight, but there's some data there. And I, th I would just really encourage everybody, you probably haven't seen that in your career. It's, it's something to really think on that equipment losses are actually only a very small percent influenced by maintenance at a typical facility. And if you're serious about root cause and you're serious about getting all those losses back, you need to stop blaming maintenance and, and look around at, at all the other losses. Um, and last of the overall strategy and most important is how are we going to actually eat the elephant? So I hope I've given you some tools that you sort of at a high level say, where's the problem areas? Let's focus down on these areas. The guiding policy, I hope I've given you some things to think about where I think boundaries need to be at least communicated and ideally communicated regularly. Uh, and the last piece, of course, then, is how do we then take that and make a plan? Um, and the, the most powerful example I can give you, uh, and sometimes people don't believe that I do this, but I literally do it uh, in, two, in two week intervals. I do line items of about 200 line items in a spreadsheet at a work breakdown structure level. So once that uh, Rummelt style kernel of strategy is set up, every two weeks we're going through a 200 line item spreadsheet. And what I've put up here, I call, this is just the words that, the catchphrase I've used. You can call it one, two, and three, whatever you want to call it. But what I encourage you on a actually doing strategy level, there's, there's your current executing plan. There's one that's kind of there formed up that you're, you're pretty sure you know what you're doing and it's the details are getting populated in. And then there's another plan about how are we going to do things differently? And that's, that's that whole thing again about there's always a third wave we're not cattle, we're humans. How are we going to do things differently and keep changing? Uh, and I find it's really hard work, so people don't want to do it. It involves discipline, which is operational excellence is all about. Uh, you got to have these large, unwieldy lists of things that you need to do, uh, and you need to do them. And I'm just going to provide like one example where we actually did this. Um, this is the, the Oz IMM Moss health check I was talking about. You can just literally put that up on your wall and color code it. We did two week, 200 line, 100, 200 line item action plans for a, three, a set of three runs. And that's the kind of results we got in the team. So less than three months, I would encourage you, like this was probably a pretty unique situation where change was necessary, had to happen immediately. Um, but I think it's upon us all to think about, even if you're in a stable operation, think about the change that you're not affecting by not doing this granular element of strategy. Uh, and then I talked a little bit about 12Q before, but what I encourage you, whatever your leadership measurement framework is, right? Like you need to embed it. So the coherent action around, well, Graham, how do we get leadership right? It's, it really is. Leadership-wise, we always talk about production. Leadership-wise, what are we doing each shift? What are we doing each day, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annually? Um, and the way I do it is I literally embed this survey, and I talk about it all the time till people uh, probably think I'm crazy. Um, but it also gets some pretty serious engagement, and I've, I can show it with data now. I can sh show you that it improves over time. So it doesn't have to be 12Q, but do measure leadership and make sure it's part of your coherent actions that daily, weekly, monthly, you're doing it. Um, and then bow ties, uh, coming back to that as a coherent action. So bow ties are great for facilitating the diagnosis, but wonderfully, they're also a great thing to put up on the wall. And yes, there's lots of fantastic programs out there. 
that you can do it electronically. Um, but in this particular area, I'm a Luddite, and I really find it wonderful to put it up on a wall where people can see color-coded traffic lights around. We've said in the middle of the bow tie, there's an item that we are, no one's willing to accept happening. And on the left-hand side of the bow tie, we've said, here's all the things we're going to do to stop that from happening. And for accountability in a team, it's a wonderful thing because if, you've, if everybody's walking past a diagram of a bow tie with a bunch of red lights on the left-hand side and then the event in the middle happens, it's a pretty simple accountability discussion. Um, uh, this is uh, a coherent action. I just want to shoehorn in. Maybe it doesn't belong in this presentation. Uh, again, this is a Grahamism, but I, I force people to read books. <laughs> Some people don't like reading books. Um, but I'm going to quote Charlie Munger again. In my whole life, I've known no wise people who didn't read all the time. None, zero. So. Uh, there's some simple books out there, right? And I'm just putting one up here that I literally hand out like candy at all the operations I go to. Uh, Extreme Ownership is a book that just talks about these scenarios where something bad happens and when the teams get together afterwards, there's no blaming. There's literally every single person in the room will speak up and say, there's something either I did or did not do that allowed that thing to happen. And then it goes around the room, and eventually, whoever the leader is who's ultimately accountable, they will step up and they will say, actually, I understand what you're all saying, but I'm accountable for this. I set up the team, and I planned this work. And guess what? That's my fault. Um, it's pretty powerful stuff when you get to see it happening. Um, so uh, last but not least, word of advice. This is uh, Ross Jennings, a good friend of mine. He taught me this, diarize it. Uh, if you're a person who um, doesn't like conflict like me, seek it out every day. And what I do is I literally, once a day, I have a conversation that I don't want to have, and it's usually the conversation I most need to have. Um, and the Russian brothers, just to make a final comeback, um, less of and more of those two Russian brothers are applicable, and I'd like you to put that in co your coherent actions. So I often see lists of actions of what to do, what I don't see in these operations of lists of actions of what to stop doing. Um, and the last thing, this has been uh, probably a profound uh, change for me in, in the industry. I, I, hope, I, th I hope it's not everywhere, but in mining it's just been everywhere I go that this seems to stand true. And this is Richard Rummelt, the guy who's written the kernel of good strategy. Um, inertia due to obsolete and inappropriate routines can be fixed. It's a barriers are the perceptions of top management. And as much as I don't want to believe that, uh, in, in most cases when, when key leadership leaves the building, change happens effectively, swiftly, immediately. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, adjectives I, or adverbs I could give you there. So um, if you're a senior leader, uh, be better. Okay. That's it. Any questions?